first of all, thank you to the organizers for uh, adding, adding more early earth to the agenda and, and letting me have an opportunity to describe this work. Uh, so this is a version of a talk I gave to the uh, mineral physics community. They have a similar small gathering called Comcrest uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, this, the title for that talk was a eulogy for the basal magma ocean. Uh, as, essentially, the basal magma ocean is an idea that emerged out of the mineral physics community. Uh, so it turns out that that was a little bit too poetic of a, a talk title <laughs> because a lot of people decided I was coming to the meeting to put the idea of the basal magma ocean to rest, to just lay it down. And, uh, and so I, I did start off accidentally by personifying the basal magma ocean. And the whole talk was kind of structured as like a history of the basal magma ocean, its life achievements, and uh, um, anyway, BMO is, uh, he was affectionately referred to by his, uh, his friends, may have been born sometime around four and a half billion years ago, may have died uh, sometime really unknown uh, about a billion years ago possibly, and uh, and so this was actually confusing because they, they were a little disappointed that I was actually uh, showing reasons and uh, what the scientific rationale is behind adding a basal magma ocean. So I will explicitly say at the beginning of this talk that uh, it's a requiem. I'm going to uh, celebrate the basal magma ocean dynamo. And this is, this is a, an idea for... The early Earth's magnetic field, it, it existed, we believe, 3.5 billion years ago. It may have existed sooner. Uh, and you know, this, this idea is something that's been, uh, it's been supported by NSF in a variety of ways. One, through a postdoctoral fellowship to Leah Ziegler. She's able to work uh, part of her time on this. Uh, through CIDR funding and through uh, CSETI funding. And now, uh, oh, that's much better. Great. And so, maybe I guess the only uh, the real tombstone here is that Leah uh, Ziegler's uh, academic career didn't survive this. And maybe, uh, so that's why the Requiem is sort of going to have this uh, dynamo idea live on. And I got Chris, sorry, you're, I put you down. I didn't ask, ask for permission. But he's very welcome to uh, claim he's not associated in, in a, a very strong way to this. He's provided us some codes and and some help, so this puts sort of this, this uh, association here in, in quotation marks because it's actually, it turns out a little heretic. This is actual heresy that, that a dynamo could be generated in the mantle and not in the core. So that is what this talk is and, and sort of the uh, indirect circumstantial evidence and the logic of the concept. So. Earth's, Earth has a, its thermal history has a crisis, and that's what I want, that's what, what ultimately this is about. Now, regardless of whether there's a magnetic field in the beginning or not, that actually can help us get an idea of how to resolve the crisis, but the crisis exists uh, regardless. Now, Q, that's the heat flow, that's the amount of heat coming out of the surface of the Earth. We've got a good measurement of that, that's the one thing we know really well. It can, I, now, Here's a plot of uh, mantle temp potential temperature and where we think rocks have been forming through time. It looks like this sort of been cooling. So that's good. Thermodynamics is working. The Earth is, is cooling and losing heat. Uh, this is going back to the beginning of the time. We don't have a lot of data here. And so H is typically uh, radiogenic heating. So that's the amount. And these numbers are uh, units of terawatts. So sort of 20 terawatts, 30 terawatts. There's 46 terawatts. You saw Chris put a pie chart up yesterday from Claude Chapar's uh, treatise article. So this is about 67%, about uh, a little less than half. And they, they bracket it. But the point is uh, they don't really go through this very well. And it is possible that if you have a lot of radioactivity, you can delay the cooling of the Earth. So there's, there's two sources of heat in the Earth. One is the Earth cooling down, either the mantle or the core, the secular cooling. That's just, it started off hot and it's cooling. And that heat is escaping 
So we, the heat we're measuring could be that from that, or it could be from radioactivity. And, and if it's a lot of radioactivity, then that means a smaller fraction of the heat we're, we're seeing come out is from the Earth cooling. Right? And that's just the two places it can be. If it's a lot of radioactivity, then it's actually slowed the cooling of the mantle. The, the secular cooling of the mantle has been delayed because there's a lot of extra radiogenic heat. But if there's enough to actually delay the secular cooling, because it's exponential, when you get way, uh, pretty far back in time, you got actually too much radiogenic heat. And so you end up with um, the mantle getting very high temperatures because it's exponentially decaying. So as you travel it back in time, that exponential blows up. But if we don't have a lot of radiogenic heat, then that means a lot of the heat coming out of the surface is due to secular cooling. And if it's due to secular cooling, if we extrapolate those temperatures back in time, so for example, nice handy units of like 100 degrees per billion years. That's a nice unit, and it's sort of, that's what that would look like, or 50 degrees per billion years. But this kind of slope, where we didn't have a lot of radiogenic heating, is more like 200 <laughs> degrees per billion years. So now in three billion years, the mantle would have been 600 degrees hotter, and it's molten again. So either way, we end up with the, this is the crisis, we end up with the molten mantle, either way. Lost radiogenic heating, not much radiogenic heating. So how do we solve this? So this figure here by Koronaga in the annual review and, and other work, and he provides some, some ideas of how to resolve the crisis. And, uh, but the other, so then I want to convert these sort of more in, intuitive numbers of cooling rates to terawatts, because that's sort of what we think of Earth's uh, budget. And it really does look like these are the, you know, 100 or 80. These are kind of uh, agree with what the data shows. So these are kind of the values that we, we would adopt. So I know that you like looking at tables. Uh, <laughs> from yesterday's talks. And this is the table that Leah Ziegler made as part of the CIDR group. So there's that 46 terawatts that we observed coming out. And three typical uh, values of geochemical models that have been proposed. And then the secular cooling of the mantle, which can be either those uh, 8, 12, or 15, those reasonable type values that, that I just showed. Now the rest, if we, if we pick a radiogenic model and the secular cooling of the mantle, the rest of the heat coming out has to be from the core. And that's where the Earth's magnetic field helps resolve this crisis, because that gives us information. If we can put some kind of bounds on this, that, that actually can eliminate scenarios. That'd be helpful. And uh, the core heat flow is unknown. So just a quick example, the, you would add sort of these columns horizontally. So these three things will add to 46, or you can have eight and eight, or 15 and one. If you adopt a lot of this heating, not only do you end up with too much radiogenic elements earlier in time, there's also not a geochemist on the planet that would, would buy this um, bulk silk earth model of how much radiogenic elements there are in the earth that it's born with. So that's sort of one, one problem. <clears throat> And uh, it's nice to, when you're talking about thermal history of the Earth to get a few geochemists to buy in. So these are the, the preferred geochemistry models. So we're kind of limited to these subsets here. And if we look at the one with H being the, the lower end, we believe that about eight uh, of these terawatts are in the crust, which leaves almost no heat, no radiogenic heat in the rest of the Earth. And that means we're talking about most of the, of the heat coming out of the surface being from cooling of the mantle, which we would observe based on those petrologic data be around 12. And so this leads to the high core heat flow regime. And uh, so we'll, we'll discuss that, but these, if, if you have such high core heat flows, that means that as you extrapolate those back in time, the heat, the, the core temperature is getting hotter and hotter back in time to maintain these kinds of very high heat flows. Again, you end up with a molten 
mantle, at least the bottom portion. And then the standard geochemistry model with 20 terawatts from uh, its, tool, its uh, radiogenic a mantle of sort of about 15, and we would then require 11 terawatts coming out of the core. Is that reasonable? And this is where a constraint from the dynamo and from the type of work that Chris Davies was showing can come in handy, because the question is, what is, so the information from thermal models of the core will help, help test the viability of this scenario. <laughs> And then the question is, what's the minimum cooling of the core that gives a dynamo for three and a half billion years? And if you want to set it back further, then you can ask for further, okay? And, and the, uh, the thermal conductivity of the core uh, material weighs in very heavily on how much heat the, is the minimum required. So that, um, Chris went over that. And I'll show a slightly different version from um, Chris Davies' uh, 2015 paper. The difference between the previous values that were preferred and, and these sort of revised values that are being offered. This is a plot of dynamo entropy. So we need it to be about above this dashed line to have a reasonable type of dynamo to say the dynamo could have existed. And this is the core heat flow. So the more heat coming out of the core, uh, the, the better, uh, the more entropy that you will generate. And then the further above this, this line you will be. So if we look at the blue, it has to exceed the minimum. And the minimum would be defined as the adiabatic uh, heat flow, which is the amount of heat that can just be conducted out of the core. We actually have to have core convection. So you've got to exceed the amount that can be conducted. For the blue, that would be this amount. For the old values, and for the new values, it would be about this amount. Now, it's possible to have uh, a magnetic field. You see that these, these values cross here, and that this, this is in the range of plausibility, because this would be the subadiabatic dynamo, or that if you have inner core convection, I'm sorry, inner core crystallization, then you can support a magnetic field through growth of the inner core. And you don't have to exceed the minimum, the, the adiabatic uh, minimum. But if you don't have an inner core, then this is the amount that you have to exceed with the new values. So if you only have an inner core for a short amount of time of Earth's history, then for the majority of Earth's history, you'll have to exceed this amount. If you see where this is going, this, is, this means high heat flows for uh, most of Earth's history, and we end up with the molten mantle again. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, hopefully you, the, the, you can course, correlate that high heat flows of the core uh, imply young inner cores. So just to summarize, uh, these are high core heat flows, so we'll end up with a, a molten mantle. These are invalid based on geochemists and geodynamo or geomagnetic constraints. And these still have high cooling rates, but these are sort of the most plausible. They do in, imply young inner cores. We still have a crisis. And so uh, these are the ones that were not valuable. Okay, so uh, there are other suggestions, uh, but one, one idea is just, let's just adopt the, let's just start entertaining the idea that Earth's mantle could be remain molten for some amount of time, or that a lot of these roads lead to a molten earth. What is, what is that consequence? So how does a molten earth solidify? If it was completely molten, one point, how does it solidify? Uh, this is work by Sixrude using density functional theory to try and estimate the phase diagram of a, of a, of a liquid, of a silica, liquid melts at high pressure and temperature to get their densities. You can see that these melts actually can cross over and have, um, the melts can be more dense than the solid at the same temperature and pressure. And another interesting thing is that the, the liquidus uh, curves are, have some curvature to them. And so that would imply that an, an adiabat in the liquid will intersect where it will melt uh, in the middle of the mantle. And so a cartoon of this would be a geotherm 
on a small planet like the moon or Mars, we think had magma oceans, we intersect the liquidus and crystallization will begin at the, uh, at the bottom and continue to the top, which is fine. And the magma ocean will solidify in, in a short time. It's only limited by the amount of radiative heat escaping out of the surface. If it intersects in the middle, the same is true for the top. It can solidify very quickly, but then for this lower portion of the mantle, that it can remain molten because now it's happy. It's got a blanket of 2,000 kilometers of silicate rock to protect it from the cold environment of space. So it's got a very good insulator once this, once this part solidifies. And that's why this, this molten part can survive and persist for billions of years. And this is the idea that uh, Labrosse proposed, which is this gray part is the solid part and the yellow part is the liquid part. You can see this solid, the top solidifying and the bottom part remaining liquid for up to billions of years. So this was uh, quite, this is more of a conceptual model in this paper with the middle out solidification and they used some, a real idealized phase diagram because we don't really have uh, the, the lower mantle, uh, we, don't, we don't know the phase diagram for the Earth's composition at lower mantle at high temperatures and high pressures. And essentially the, blue, the BMO's fluid dynamic regime, it's, it's a low viscosity, the silicate melts at these temperatures at low viscosity so it's actually, we can borrow a lot of what we know from core dynamics to apply to the, um, the, the basal magma ocean. <clears throat> and so in this original uh, conception of the idea, this is Labrosse's uh, paper with thickness. You can see it's starting off about a thousand or a uh, thousand kilometers thick and the blue line and then slowly decaying until it's just a few tens of kilometers. And that, that will take, at some point it's too thin to really be even called a, a, an, an ocean anymore. It's just a little pond at the bottom with all kinds of um, elements concentrated into it. So at some point it becomes a pond. Uh, we don't know, but sometime maybe in their model about a billion years ago. And the temperature you see is sort of following that, uh, decaying from on this side about 4,800 to down to about 4,000, so temperatures at the bottom of the mantle. Uh, so it's solving a thermal evolution equation. This is the energy equation. Uh, and then the normal sort of caveats. So this is parameterized. This is a, a parameterized thermal evolution model. It's been done for a very long time. And the main results of their initial um, hypothesis of the basal magma ocean will show with time, this is present day, beginning of the Earth, and this is what that minimum was for those old values I showed you for old values of thermal conductivity. Well, if, if the core heat flux exceeds that value, then for sure we don't need the inner core yet. We can maintain, we can start having a magnetic field just by being above that minimum. And in their model, that minimum happened to correspond with the first uh, undisputed uh, or less disputed observation of the Earth's magnetic field at 3.5 billion years ago. So it can have a nice, uh, and at some point the, the inner core will start solidifying. That's perfectly fine. The radiogenic heat, it has sort of a, a regular amount of um, Earth's, uh, a normal component of the bulk bulk silicate Earth in the, that 20% of the bulk silicate Earth's heating. So it's sort of decaying with time. But the other, the other thing, is this, this source here, the latent heat. So that's the energy gained from having something go from a liquid to a solid. So it's actually a major heat source. And compare this heat source with that of radiogenic heat. It's not too far off, it's a factor of two in some places. So it's a significant heat source. And that heat source is what helps delay the mantle cooling down because you don't need as much radioactivity early on if you have a big heat source of latent heat. So that's really the salient feature of the BMO hypothesis is that you get an extra heat source by having a large chunk, thousand kilometers of the mantle have to solidify and provide a lot of latent heat for all that mass. So it delays the secular cooling of the, of the mantle. It also delays the secular cooling of the core. It's suppressing the core heat flow in the beginning. 
So in this in this period, this model predicts no no magnetic field. This would this model would prohibit a magnetic field. The core heat flow is not exceeding it, and everything is stably stratified from the core to the basal magma ocean. Uh, geochemists, well, it's, it actually works out all right for geochemists because you've got a mechanism to take some amount of uh, the Earth's um, rare Earths and, and squeeze them down to a small layer that maybe sometimes plumes can tap or not. So it's a wonderful little trash can to hide any type of ancient reservoir. So it would be similar to the creep layer on the moon if you're familiar with that. As far as the magnetic uh, evolution of the Earth, as I said, it delays secondary cooling of the core. But uh, there's one, one thing that, that was sort of maybe looked over, and the assumption that these silicate melts still remain as an insulator. Okay, but, but how conductive are actually melts at the bottom, uh, melts, their conductivity is more than solids. And the other thing is when these revised, so LaBrosse's paper in 2007, predated these new estimates, and once these new estimates arrived, well, now it seems that the, that model is now incapable of generating magnetic field at any point during Earth's history. Because for entirety of Earth's history, the core cooling is, is insufficient to meet uh, a dynamo. And so we, we revised this model. We changed just a few parameters ever so slightly. You can see the LaBrosse models in dashed and our models in uh, solid, it's really, really quite a similar model. And in, in the one that we had, we ended up having a, an enormous amount of latent heat. So because we made the, we essentially made it thicker to begin with, that was it. We started with a thicker magma ocean. So we had more latent heat to get rid of to further suppress the core heat flow. But it comes back later on in Earth's history in a stronger way, which will now exceed that minimum. And at this point is when the actual uh, co core heat flow can exceed the minimum to turn on a dynamo. But what about this period here? So this is the part that we thought, well, maybe, maybe the fluid motions in, in the, uh, maybe the electrical conductivity of, that, of the, man the molten mantle could be high enough to generate a dynamo. So that was the idea to explore because uh, yeah, we're not too far off uh, mol molten, the solid mantle at the core mantle boundary can range up to 100 Siemens per meter. The core values are four orders of magnitude. So we just need a couple orders of magnitude and it's sort of right at the hairy edge. So um, it's already been observed that oxides become weakly metallic um, at lower mantle pressures. And in this basal magma ocean hypothesis, instead of the light up, instead of sort of the analogy of a inner core crystallizing out and concentrating light elements into the outer core, the way basal magma ocean works is it's solidifying out magnesium perovskite as it's, as it's solidifying, and that is dumping excess iron into the melt. So the melt is gradually getting heavier and heavier, less likely to sink and rise up, but also possibly increasing its electrical conductivity. So how to assess this? A typical way used by core dynamicists is our friend, the uh, magnetic Reynolds number. If you can estimate a velocity in this fluid, and a standard approach would be to use mixing link theory to get an estimate of the velocity, to have the layer thickness, we said it, it was on order of 1,000 kilometers, and to have, we're entertaining semi-metallic type <laughs> conductivities between something that is observed for solids on the low end and something a few orders of magnitude lower than a, me a metal. So we're going to look at these uh, sort of ranges just to explore. And then actually you need a minimum of about 100 or um, normally pi squared, but people like it to be 100. OK. And so this is what we got for that period. We knew the velocities of our model because we had a heat flow coming out. And there's the, okay, so now this plot is showing dynamo number. So it's, we can't use the, the magnetic Reynolds number directly because it turns out that the magma ocean is overlying another body that is, is very conductive, which is the core. And so this is something that they have used to understand the solar dynamo, 
which is that you make a magnetic Reynolds number of the core, because because this is not it's not invisible. The core is not invisible to the magnetic to the magnetism happening above it, and the magnetic field lines can leak into it. So they they could possibly work in concert like this by adding by multiplying their square root. And so this this dynamo number here is about 100. And for these different uh, conductivities, and one model where we had a variable conductivity assuming some very simple sort of iron enrichment affecting and increasing the conductivity, uh, several of these models were able to exceed the minimum for several billion years. So making us think, OK, it's plausible. So in this scenario, uh, we have a, a nice way to delay the secular cooling of the Earth and the core to help us get out of that paradox, that crisis, because we've just assumed that, that a large chunk of the Earth is molten. That's OK. We just sort of mitigate that crisis to the lower mantle okay, and just live with it. And the consequence is, if the melts have a high enough electrical conductivity, maybe they can supply uh, the the source of the dynamo in the mantle, in the molten mantle, for this period of time, while we have, uh, while the, the velocities are high enough, essentially, and the, and the thickness is, is big enough. The thickness matters is a lot for the Re Reynolds number you saw. And then uh, the core would turn on. At some point, it becomes a pond because it's too small, but now the core has a lot of heat that it's been saving up, and it wants to dump into the mantle and get out. So now the core dynamo could turn on without an inner core. And then at subsequent time, maybe the inner core could turn on. So we would propose, and this is uh, Andy Biggins here. This, this is uh, data that Leah uh, <laughs> used from the, the Pint database and uh, did some, some filtering similar to the uh, 2008 paper, I believe, that, that he had, which kind of showed, um, in rough terms, three magnetic eras. Uh, which are a high field strength, a lower field strength, and then a modern day field strength for the Phanerozoic. And yeah, there are some gaps in the data, uh, 100 million years, 200 million years, significant gaps. We have no uh, real intensity data, but maybe reversal data. Anyway, this is not a totally continuous record, but there may, it may be an opportunity to see, okay, this could have been generated in, in the it's the concept is this is generated in the mantle from the uh, magma ocean and the core turned on, but it, since it didn't have an inner core solidifying, it could have been a weaker field. Um, this is also generated a little closer to the surface, which also helps increase the field strength, right? The bottom of the mantle is closer to the surface. So you should know that that helps a lot increase the, the uh, intensity. So we propose that these three magnetic eras could be just those where the magnetic field is generated at the bottom of the mantle uh, in the early Earth, and then inside the core during the Proterozoic, and then finally our modern field is sort of that birth of the inner core. And, uh, and so the last month at the AGU, I'm walking around poster sessions, and I saw, hey, this, this figure looks familiar. It's on somebody's poster. So who, whose poster is that? So there's that figure. And, uh, and so this is actually Sheffiani and Stixrud. Well, I know those guys. That Stixrud is the one that proposed they used density functional theory to describe the magma oceans existed or possibly existed in the first place. So those first figures that I showed of the the solidus and liquidus and the adiabat and the molten earth. So they used density functional theory, and what they've done is use a larger number of atoms. So actually, this is the interesting thing. I want to want to zoom in on this part of the poster here. Because they've used a larger number, and they named this the Ziegler minimum. That was really sweet of them. <laughs> and, uh, and so at high temperatures, they're getting conductivities of 10 to the 4, which are, which are right in the ballpark. 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5, right in the ballpark of what our model had proposed. Uh, and they're, to do this, they're using the biggest calculations Lars has ever run, 1,000 atoms. These are very expensive simulations. Uh, using not just magnesium, not just uh, uh, the, the standard four, but they've added in the effects of some of the other major elements. And they're really approaching some metallic values. Okay, so electrical conductivity may be, may be uh, something, 
to, to further consider. Uh, this, this slide here is for, for Bruce. Um, so I have to add a few extra equations and, uh, and show that we did consider a few other scaling analyses. And in this case, uh, this scaling analysis, other than mixing length, show uh, some of these work. We don't actually know what the right scaling is to use for the core. Uh, we wouldn't really know exactly what the right scaling is to use for the mantle. These things are still somewhat debated, so a couple of them sort of pass the muster. But anyway, we're, we're at the edge of what we can learn from this approach, and that motivated us to um, uh, adopt a new, a new approach. So uh, Andy Biggin showed this slide yesterday. As, I don't know if Andy's in the room. Hi, Andy. Are you there? Oh, there, there you are. Um, OK, so the dispersion, right? So the dispersion through time. The Archean field is more axisymmetric than the modern Earth. The modern Earth's data for the past half billion years shows um, less axisymmetry than older data. That's what this plot is telling us. The so one interpretation is that a stronger dipole can, is, is more stable and would have less reversals. But the, strictly speaking, this data is, is just saying it's more axisymmetric. So an alternative interpretation is that the early magnetic field of the Earth was in fact less dipolar, but could have been a stronger octopole, okay, as an axisymmetric term. It just had to have a, uh, no quadrupole. Okay, Sabine, this one's for you. So she ran them very interesting models trying to understand Ven uh, sorry, Uranus and Neptune's thin shell dynamos. And so this is sort of the geometry we would have for Earth with the, um, the core, the inner core ticking, well, this is a, 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 a factor of about half, I guess. And then as the outer core shrinking more and more until it's just a very thin shell. So this is the model eight. That's the magenta color on this slide with the, the degree um, dipole, quadrupole, octopole, and the power. And so this is all normalized to Earth at one. To see for Earth, it would go bang, bang, dominantly dipolar. But once you start considering a magnetic field generation in alternative geometries, well, you don't end up with really low quadrupoles at all, do you? Every single one of these models has a huge quadrupole term. Some are quadrupole do dominant. And then model eight is, in fact, octopole dominant, which could also, so just, just throwing out there that, that this, in fact, the magma ocean would be uh, a thin shell dynamo. And, and would, this would have a, a predict the same type of dispersion that the, uh, the Earth shows. OK, so quickly wrap up. What is the new approach? We've, we've gotten, we've squeezed everything we can out of this conceptual model and the, and the energy evolution. So we've made a new, uh, developed a new code. This is where Chris has helped. And we called it Dynamantle. It is uh, essentially a recapitulation of the, of the type of uh, physics that, that you saw Chris describing yesterday, an entropy-based model that we can actually determine the ohmic dissipation going on. And so the question is, what can this scenario provide enough ohmic dissipation to state whether or not this magma ocean can have a dynamo or not. So that is what we're going to be testing. Uh, and a, and a, nice, a nice benefit of this is it avoids the whole debate about what the actual values of electrical conductivity are. And so maybe this is a new field. I could be the first editor for the journal of geodynamagnetism. OK, so the main thing I want to say is that Lebrasse, it was a conceptual idea. He did a wonderful job, but it had its limits. And uh, one of these limits was that it was a highly idealized uh, crystallization model. It didn't actually have an adiabat in it. And so some of the real physics of what we've, we've been working on is, is adding in the adiabat. OK, so I just wanted to give two slides showing, demonstrating that uh, the new code is actually producing something reasonable. What we've done is take the core heat flow out of the Lebrasse model, of the, um, out of our model, but mostly the Lebrasse model, impose that, run the entropy calculation, and backed out what the actual um, history of the melting curve would have been. Because in his, it's just a straight line in some idealized space that's not, doesn't have a 
pressure and temperature as axes. So we've backed out what the actual phase I melting curve that he had would have been. So this is what would have been what, and, and it's actually a result of increasing um, iron concentration as it is cooling. That extra iron is severely depressing the melting point, depressing the liquidus. And so this entropy code does actually uh, reproduce the, the same answer that we had previously from the, just the thermal evolution model. So we've got an agreement of the new code providing an entropy-based approach, um, re basically getting the same answer we had before, and now we'll be adding in uh, playing games with the lower mantle phase diagram to entertain uh, what this might mean in terms of could, the, could this magma ocean have enough ohmic dissipation to have a dynamo. All right, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dave. Questions out there? Yeah, so how small of a body?